Whatever rots your socks, whatever spins your top Whatever winds your watch, whatever flips your flop Whatever turns you on, whatever flies your flag Whatever bangs your gong or whatever swings your bag Do it often but do it well Cause nobody knows and there's no way to tell When the ride ends Good morning. Welcome back to Turtle Beach. How was your week? I am either sad or glad to hear that. My week was terrific. All weeks are terrific on Turtle Beach. We're going to step out on the beach here and I'm going to tell you about it. You can tell <clears throat> my neighbor Maurizio's home. They went away for the festival. Uh, I don't blame them for it. it. It gets awfully loud and crowded and dirty out here on the street for the 10 days of the Turtle Festival. You know how you can tell they're back. Yeah, they got three big dogs and they never shut up. Never shut up. Oh, well, good fences make good neighbors and they have certainly built a good fence there. So uh, there's a terrific week on Turtle Beach. They're all terrific weeks on Turtle Beach. I had such high, high hopes for this week. I planned to take us down, ride the bike down to the remain of the tin dredging and take you walking with me on the beach as I look for trash. But I have fine tuned in 18 months my brownie recipe to the point where I'm actually sleeping through the night like a, a normal human being. And when you're 66 and male and you can sleep through the night, boy, that's a blessing. But it means that in the morning, I'm very groggy and loggy. And uh, this morning I just, I got up too late. I didn't get on the bicycle. So instead of showing you the beautiful beach and the garbage I pick up, I'll show you the garbage that the furniture store did not pick up when they blew out of here in the middle of the night. You know, like anywhere, when the circus leaves town, they leave in the middle of the night. These are some Obata employees, these ladies in the red shirts, they're picking up the trash. Yeah, they're, it's supposed to be the vendors who pick up their own trash, but what are you gonna do? What are you gonna do? Supposedly, every visitor to this fair brings 200 baht into the local economy. And boy, there were tens and tens of thousands of prisoners prisoners <laughs> where the fuck did that come from dr freud uh, uh visitors <laughs> tens of thousands of prisoners on turtle beach boy you're a prisoner in paradise anyway we're gonna come out here and sit on the beach and i'm gonna talk at you for a while uh it's morning like i always uh, yeah i'll give you the usual uh it's morning so the sun's over there we don't get sunrises here we get sunsets beautiful sunsets and uh this is the green sward and that's the sun coming up over there behind my house that's my house and uh yeah we're gonna sit down here and talk <coughs> this time of year i don't know if you can see it uh, the wind is such, we're beginning to shift. Uh, May will bring the monsoon. And it's already digging away the beach. You can't see it from here, but there's like a six foot berm. To get to the water, you have to drop down a six foot berm. And it's that way six months out of the year. Another reason why this beach will never be developed. Uh, six months out of the year, your guests would need a bridge to get to the beach, unless they want to jump, like me. All right, here we go. <laughs> uh, yeah, you know, other people would probably uh, edit this bit out, wouldn't they? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, Steve, don't play that game. Homie, don't play that editing game. Yeah, all right, there we go. How you doing? I hope things are going better on your side. Oh, crap, I forgot to bring my coffee out. One of these mornings, I'm going to do this with a cup of lime juice. I have a lime tree in my backyard. I have two fruit-bearing trees in my backyard. Came with the place. 
I have a lime tree that produces about three limes a year and I have a pineapple plant that produces one tiny little pineapple a year. And uh, my friend Gordon Tickle uh, starts his days, uh, he's doing some sort of modified fasting thing. So he's starting with uh, vinegar and uh, starting his days with vinegar and uh, uh, bals uh, balsamic vinegar and, and lime juice. And, and I was going to do that once just in solidarity for my friend Gordon. But I prepared it. I left it in there in the mug. What are you going to do? All the big mistakes are made in pre-production, aren't they? My friend John says, I'm Otzi the Iceman. You remember Otzi? They found this old caveman frozen into the ice in Switzerland and uh, thought him out. And uh, uh, yeah, he says, I'm the Iceman because all of my opinions of Thailand are 30 years out of date. And I think he's probably uh, uh, true in that. If you don't know my backstory, <clears throat> the ants are discovering my feet. <laughs> Why can nothing ever be easy? Uh, yeah, so I spent seven years on Phuket 30 years ago. And I just came back to Thailand to retire 18 months ago. And uh, yeah, anything I might know about Thailand is something I read in a book in the New York City Public Library or is something that was real specifically in Phuket, specifically 30 years ago. What it's like now, if you're living up in Pra or you're living on Silam Road, uh, yeah, it's it's probably different where you are. So caveat, uh, caveat mTOR, uh, anything I say is either 30 years out of date uh, or it's specific uh, to where I'm living right now. I want to thank somebody named Roger, I think, Marez, M-A-R-E-Z, uh, who was very, very generous. You know, there's a PayPal link uh, in the description. I don't mention it a lot. That cup of coffee button doesn't seem to work in Thailand for some obscure banking rule. Ah, uh, but PayPal still, despite what the, uh, the doom and gloom uh, sellers wanted you to believe a year ago, PayPal is still operating in Thailand. And there is a, a uh, an address down there. Uh, and uh, Roger Marez <clears throat> was very, very generous. Thank you, Roger. It's not necessary. I live very well on 1500 US a month. I have everything I need and a bunch of shit I don't need. And uh, my days are full and I'm happy and I don't need any more money. If you want to send it to me, I did this week buy a bandsaw <laughs> and an electric carving knife to sculpt foam. I have promised now three of my uh, cigarette lighter turtles made with cigarette lighters reclaimed off the beach. I've promised three to local businesses and then I've got to make next year's parade float, which will be three times the size of this year's float. Uh, so, I'm all right. Thank you, Roger. I'm gonna, that, that 200 bucks bought me a bandsaw. I very much appreciate that. Uh, but you, you guys don't have to do that. That's, I'm, I'm doing fine. Yeah, I'm not a charity case. I, I had my operation hernia repair, paid for it out of pocket, bupkis, and great work in a public hospital. So I appreciate that, but don't, don't, don't think Steve is out here, you know, counting his saloon coins and buying cow thumb and living off that. Uh, anyway, thank you, Roger. <clears throat> uh, the, one of the first steps in doing one of these turtles is, uh, you carve the base out of, uh, uh, styrofoam and then you, uh, clad it in paper mache, a uh, newspaper soaked in glue. And that gives you a hard shell on which to adhere your, uh, cigarette lighters. It is turning out harder and harder to find newspaper. That wonderful absorbent rough uh, textured uh, newsprint that makes really rigid, strong paper mache, and it's free. You just pull it out of garbage cans. Uh, about a year ago, I bought a big stack of it from a local vendor, and that vendor now has gone out of business. I need more. I with one turtle, I went through that stack of paper, and then you're past that part in the project, and, you, and you're gluing on lighters, and so you don't need newspaper again. So the last couple of weeks, Chamnan and I have gone out looking for newspapers. Chamnan found a bunch of them behind where he gets his hair cut. The barber used to keep newspapers out, uh, you know, as, as in Mayberry. Uh, Floyd would keep the local newspaper on the, and when you were waiting for your chair, you, you would read the paper. 
uh, these papers are three or four years old. Uh, but they're still they're They're great for the project. But it, it, I'm thinking of this because I saw a uh, uh, some some guy made a video about how he lost his job as a tour guide. He was talking about the tour bus went past a motorcycle accident and the body, the dead person was laying there on the pavement. And he said, you know, in Thailand, they don't cover the body. They just leave it out there until the ambulance comes. Well, no, they used to put newspapers over it. I used to work for the Phuket Gazette and Phuket's roads have always been abattoirs. And thank you for that music selection, 6.30 in the morning. And these hillbillies are playing their country music. Ah, uh, yeah, you, you need some motivation. You need Ya Ba and, and uh, Ram Wong to <laughs> Luke Tung. You need Luke Tung and, and Ya Ba to tear down these big marquee tents. Uh, at any rate, they used to cover the bodies with, with newspapers. I used to go out and, and uh, interview people at crash sites. There's always crashes. People die like flies on motorcycles on Phuket, and they still do. And they used to cover them with newspapers. And it occurs to me, this guy thinks they don't cover the bodies because there's no longer newspapers laying around everywhere to use to cover the bodies, right? That's just something that's gone from our world. Newspapers put food on my table and, and, and fed my kids and bought, you know, anti-gripe water for my kids. Uh, newspapers, you know, employed me for a long time. And now it's gone in my lifetime, just in the past few years. Poof, it's gone. I don't know if you can see it. There's another shoal of fish. This one, a very tiny one just offshore. And a guy fishing. I don't know if he's hunting those same fish, but you see that dark patch out there. That's that's fish. What little life is left in the Andaman Sea. So, uh, yeah, Steve can no longer uh, support himself writing for newspapers and people have nothing to, to cover dead bodies uh, on the road after the accidents. I never, that had never occurred to me. I'd never thought of that. I want to tell you uh, a couple stories. The first one, uh, apropos of nothing, I was just thinking about this uh, today, this morning. Uh, in 2007, I was offered a job teaching medical transcription on the island of Trinidad in the Caribbean, Trinidad and Tobago is a little island country. It, uh, it's a pair of islands. Uh, the Caribbean, what we call the Caribbean, begins at Key West and ends at Trinidad. It's five miles off the shore of Venezuela. And uh, it's the southernmost tip of what we call the Caribbean. And uh, they had a little Voc Tech college. They wanted somebody to come teach medical transcription and infrastructure light industry that uh, native English speakers could do. So uh, India, the Philippines, and the Caribbean were trying to take away the work from the American transcriptionists. And I contributed to that, to the death of my industry. Little did we know that within just a few years, uh, AI, uh, voice recognition, uh, uh, so uh, it's not actually AI, but voice recognition software, a little $8 disk of software destroyed an industry, put, well, so far about 140,000 American transcriptionists out of work. And uh, you, speaking of faux reggae, yeah, speaking of the Caribbean, I hope you can hear me. Let me see if I can scooch closer. <laughs> uh, yeah, pick up the gain and the mic. No, I'll just scooch closer. I don't know how to do the rest of that stuff. So anyway, I got invited down to the, I was locked in my house for four years. I had severe social anxiety. I didn't leave the house if I could help it for four years. I worked at home in my living room for four years as a transcriptionist, but the money they were offering was too good to turn down. It was uh, 10 months of employment, 7,000 US a month, uh, paid into an offshore account tax-free. And uh, you work four hours a day, four days a week, because the traffic is so terrible on, on Trinidad. Anybody coming to the course would spend two hours in the car just getting there. It's a dinky little island. It's a little scrap of rock out in the middle of the ocean. And uh, it has one road, a ring road, and that sucker's full, bumper to bumper, all day long, all night long. And uh, so they only had class four hours a day, four days a week. These guys are really pissing me off, really pissing me off. Uh, at any rate, so I went down to interview. Uh, I knew my social anxiety, I, I would freeze. I would have a, uh, I had had two 
uh, panic attacks in job interviews in Iowa City. Uh, and uh, that's embarrassing. If you've never dressed up, put on a tie, shaved, and gone to a job interview only to break down and have to put your head between your knees because you're hyperventilating, you're about to black out. The secretary at the water department I was interviewing for a job as a meter reader, just walking around Iowa City in the winter time, reading the water meters on the outsides of people's houses. And thought that was, that'd be a great job for Steve Ross. Lots of exercise outdoors and you don't have to talk to anybody. Uh, I, had, I was hyperventilating in the waiting room, waiting for the interview, and the secretary dumped her lunch out of a paper bag on the desk and gave me the paper bag to breathe into. And when I got my head back together, I just got up and walked. I never even stayed for the interview. Uh, so I was working from home and uh, I said, I gotta go, I gotta take this job if they'll give it to me. So I went to my therapist and I got a big bottle of Ativan, which is just an anti-anxiety drug. And I took, uh, uh, went down there, took a plane, went down to Trinidad, spent a sleepless night alone in an anonymous windowless uh, hotel room. And the next morning they sent a car and I spent two hours in traffic to get to the interview. And I walk in the room and, and I've taken three Ativan. Now, typically, one Ativan would calm me down, two Ativan would put me to sleep, three, I'd never taken three, but I was so hyper and I hadn't slept the night before and I was so wired and I was grinding my teeth, you could hear my teeth grinding. So I took three, I took two and then in the car I, I took a third and I get to the interview and there's these two Trini men who speak a, a, a patois that I don't understand a word of they're obviously executives, but they're deferring to this six foot tall, absolutely stunning black woman, the most gorgeous woman I had been in a room with for years. Her name was Wendy Fitzwilliams. She was the second black woman in history to win the Miss Universe pageant. And she had taken the money from that and gone to law school, got her law degree, became a politician. She was a member of parliament and she was supervising the budget of this Vogue Tech school, which was a government school, uh, a career school, and the, kid, uh, the, the students who went to it went free and got a stipend. They got paid to come to my class for four hours a day. Uh, but it wasn't certain at that moment that I would have a class, so I walked in the room and she spoke English beautifully, and I could speak to her and understand her and look at her. She was... <laughs> gorgeous, gorgeous woman. And I became, through the fog of the Ativan, through the tension and the anxiety and the near panic of my natural state of being, I became the funniest, smartest, wittiest, uh, and I think sexiest man in the room. And I entertained Wendy Fitzwilliams for two hours, supposed to be a half hour interview. I kept her laughing for two hours. I suppose the two men laughed as well. I don't know, I'll never, I don't know who they were. I wouldn't recognize their faces. It was me and Wendy across the table from each other flirting. Yeah, this middle-aged white guy and this absolutely stunning black woman who held all the power in that moment. And uh, I charmed her, I got the job. I went back to the hotel, I fell asleep in the car on the way to the hotel, got out of the car, went, lay down in my interview clothes, in my tie, fell asleep for about eight hours and flew home and I had the job. And I worked down there for 10 months and I paid a lot of bills uh, with that 10 months. And I bring it up because uh, you know, I, I, I take a lot of flack for the shit I say on this channel and other channels. I talk a lot and I have no filter. And that's why people invite me on their shows. People watch a Tyrish Times interview and they say, this guy, he doesn't shut up. That's why I've been invited on four times. I'm easy content. And my first interview has gotten what, 150,000 views? My first on Tyrish Times? Uh, I don't shut up and, and people want me on their, their, their channels. Uh, Tim Newton today, every week, uh, JD strange, strange TV three times, 
uh, Fruiting Body Podcast once. Uh, that's why, guys. Yeah. Don't just comment. Boy, this guy doesn't shut up. Boy, this guy likes the sound of his own voice. Yeah. That's why I'm here. If you've been watching this for 20 minutes, that's why. Uh, last thing I want to mention. I watched a movie I hadn't seen since 93 on YouTube. It's there. It's called Salween, S-A-L-W-E-E-N. It's a Thai-made movie from 93 about the situation on the Salween River, the border between Myanmar and, and Thailand, as it was in 93. And hey, it's exactly that way now. Nothing has changed on that border since 1993. It's a terrible movie. It's absolutely awful. It's shot horribly. It's edited horribly. It's acted horribly. And the writing is ham-fisted, which is weird because it was written by Sterling Siliphant, or Font Siliphant. Uh, Sterling Siliphant was a, a big, big writer in Hollywood in the 50s, 60s, and 70s. He won the Academy Award for the screenplay for a movie with Rod Steiger called uh, In the Heat of the Night, which then uh, the sequel was They Call Me Mr. Tibbs. And the, uh, the black actor's name, Foof. That's, that's the brownies, Foof. Can't remember the black actor's names. They call me Mr. Tibbs. Wonderful, wonderful movie. Sterling Siliphant wrote it. He created the TV shows Naked City. There's 11 million stories in the Naked City. This is one of them. Route 66, the TV show, he created it, wrote a bunch of the scripts for it. Big name, big name. And in the early 90s, he moved to Thailand because uh, I remember at the time, it was a big deal. People that famous didn't become expats in Thailand. Uh, he did, and he said it was because people in America had forgotten how to be polite. There were no manners in Hollywood, and he wanted to come to a place where there were good manners. So he came here, he married, he had at least one child. And at some point, he wrote this movie, Saw Weed, and he got somebody to, to produce it and somebody to direct it. And oh my God, is it terrible. It's just awful. And I remember he got, he got pilloried in the, the Post and the Nation, because this used to happen. They would make, uh, it finally ended with Ong Bak, they would make a Thai movie and say, this one, this is the one that's gonna break us into the international markets. We're gonna be like Japan now. You know, Thai cinema is going to be as, as lauded as Japanese cinema. And they would pin their hopes on this movie and it was fail, and that movie and it would fail. Gawi uh, Bang Plang, Gawi Bang Plang, the crows of Bang Plang, uh, from a novel by Kuk Pramot, uh, the, the greatest man of arts and letters this country has ever produced. Kuk Pramot, also the first, perhaps the only democratically elected prime minister, it lasted one year, but he got his face on a postage stamp. Uh, in drag, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Go look it up. Cook it, promote in uh, Thai dancing costume. Uh, at any rate, uh, I digress. Uh, so anyway, Sterling Silphat came, and he 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 came, and it was a, a big deal that he came. And here's this this famous artist is living among us, and then he produces this piece of crap, and now we don't like him anymore. <laughs> And you see that happen all the time. It doesn't get in the newspapers. Newspapers don't exist. Uh, but it doesn't get in social media when somebody big and famous buys a condo uh, in Thailand anymore. But you see it all the time. Some guy will come and he'll have just retired young from being the smartest man in the boardroom at IBM or, or, or Mazda or, or whatever. Uh, he, he's, he's a captain of industry, he or she is is a smart competent knowledgeable energetic ambitious person and they come with all these dreams and all these plans they're going to do this they're going to do that they're going to reform uh the thai uh health system uh was a recent one and I'm meeting a lot of these people. They come visit me at Moonhawks and sweet people, all of them, generous people, kind people, smart people, ambitious people. And I tell them all, stop, slow down. You didn't come here to be ambitious. If you're looking for your Turtle Beach, the terms Turtle Beach and ambition don't exist in the same sentence. And remember that, that you know, for every hundred guys and gals who come over here, with a lifetime of success behind them, 99 of them are gonna fail. 
They're gonna open a restaurant that fails. They're gonna open a carpet cleaning company that fails. They're gonna try to reform the health system and they're gonna fail. 99% of the ambitious people tank. One will be, one will be a Bill Heineke. One will be a Noah Shepard. One will get his cover on the, his face on the cover of Manager Magazine. Does Manager Magazine still exist? Big Chili. One will be interviewed by Big Chili. 99 will tank. But 100% of the people who come, smart, dumb, or otherwise, if they're come and they're not ambitious, if they are, as my cousin David described himself, a feeder fish, a sponge, you sit on a rock, you filter what comes by. Something good comes by, you eat it. Something not so good comes by, you spit it out. And you just relax and you let what comes come. 100% of those people are successful. 100% of those people are happy. 100% of those people don't get kicked out of the country. Don't get their, uh, don't film themselves assaulting a Thai citizen, a doctor, a woman, right? 100% of them don't attack an old woman with a walker in a, in a, in a mall. 100% of them don't tank, don't lose their life savings on a stupid titty bar in Pattaya. Can you imagine going home and going to a job interview at 70 and the guy says, well, I see there's a 10 year gap. You retired to Thailand 10 years ago. Why are you back in the UK or in Canada or in Australia looking for work now at 70? What do you tell him? I sunk all my money, my life savings into a titty bar on Walking Street. And of course, I lost everything. And I got VD three times and I got herpes now and I got venereal warts now. And uh, everybody in Thailand hates me and I can't go back there. And now I'm looking for work at 70. I'm broke and living on my, my children's sofas at 70 and I gotta look for work. Those are the ambitious ones. Those are 99% of the ambitious ones. 100% of the non-ambitious people are still sitting on Turtle Beach, all right? That's my rant, 26 minutes. Thank you for listening. Like, subscribe, share. It wasn't really a rant. Now, you want to see me rant, go back, look at some old videos. <laughs> I will rant. This was not a rant. The sun's coming up. I got to get out of here. I don't like the sun. Anyway, like, subscribe, share. Thank you. Know that this is the most important time of my week. I really appreciate your attention. I hope the next seven days are fantastic for you. I take it for granted. They will be fantastic for me. I'm starting the next float, the float that will go in front of uh, the store where I buy my, my cigarettes. I could go into the house now, get on the bike and ride the bike 20 kilometers, or I could uh, do some reps with the dumbbells. I'm gonna make another pot of coffee and smoke a cigarette. Thank you for watching. I'll see you next week. Take care of yourselves. My least favorite concrete turtle of all the concrete turtles in Tai Mueng, this is my least favorite. And he or she did not unfortunately survive the <laughs> festival, but it gives me a chance to see how it was made. And it, it looks like they used both concrete and styrofoam. I'm not sure those seemed like two wildly incompatible materials to me. But this thing's been out here, you know, as long as I've been in town, which granted is less than two months, uh, two years, fewer than two years. But at any rate, I don't know if they're going to try to repair this. I would not. I would not invest the materials and the time in trying to repair it. But it may have uh, sentimental value to the rangers. Uh, this is the, the, the educational center and Roberta, my turtle, uh, has been moved. She's not inside. Maybe they have taken her down to the visitor center. I'll check down there when I come back. I'm riding a bike this morning and uh, I'm gonna go down there to the end of the road and come back. Very calm, quiet sea that you, you, you cannot see the sea. See? See, you cannot see the sea. All right, I'm rambling, done now. Roberta has finally made her way to the visitor center at the National Park. The Ha Tai Mung National Park. It is part of the Ha Tai Mung Kaolampi National Park. And this is the visitor center. And uh, 
we have a new for approve this game uh, exhibition we will approve in the future and thank you for your turtle <laughs> oh thank you very much do you mind if i i, I video this for my facebook uh, is that okay? Is that's my okay. Facebook name is that, that, that's okay. That's okay. Okay. Yeah, you, you can show in your Facebook. Okay. Pom pom yang mi backdrop. Tao ao mai. Ao ao ao. Okay. Pom jo thoi bai ha kun Hans. Okay. Chai road. Kapun ha. Kapun ha. Okay. Rip right now. Man man. Pom yang mi. Tham mai suai. De tham mai suai. Wan ni. Oh, my been like so well. But I think that we don't need to have anything that is in the back. We don't need to have anything. Right? This is the best. This is the best. Yes. This is the best. This is the best. This is the best. This is the best. Yes. This is the best. Yes. This is the best. I'm so proud of it. Yes. This is the best. Yes. This is the best. Yes. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I'm going to go to Kun Han. This one is for Gordon. Gordon Tickle. When I don't have one of Gordon's videos to calm me down and lower my blood pressure, I do this. Well, basically every morning I do this. Basically, I need to lower my blood pressure all the time. But yeah, I do this every morning. I come out here and I ride on this road 10 kilometers out and 10 kilometers back. I pick up trash. This morning was a pretty good day. I've probably got 50 lighters in there and maybe a couple hundred bottle caps and some other knickknacks. Two little toy uh, plastic toy soldiers today. That's a rarity. But I haven't found a chess piece in months. And I'm bummed. I love finding chess pieces. I've got 17 of a board. I need another 15. Anyway, I digress. I'm gonna call this road Gordon's Garden. You can't see it, but maybe you can hear it. That's the beach on the other side of 50 feet of mangroves. I don't know if you can hear the surf. For most of it, you're out of the sun. <laughs> but this late in the day, it's very late. It's probably 7.30 by now. Uh, this late in the day, the sun is up. And uh, boy, it gets warm real quick. Anyway, that's enough of that. That's for you, Gordon. Whatever shaves your sheep, whatever bakes your ham, whatever digs your peat, whatever smokes your ham, whatever blows your nose, whatever chews your bone, whatever squirts your hose, whatever sings your song, do it after my do it well. Nobody knows and there's no way to tell. When you ride and this shit you be doing down to the you be up a boo doo 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 doo